Alrighty, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Jordan. I'm one of the second years, um, and today we'll be going through uh, the revision lecture for upper limb anatomy. Um, just from the outset, I want to say that any images that are in here aren't mine. I did not create them. Um, all rights go to the creators. And by all means, um, if anything confuses you about anatomy or anything else, um, or you just want to chat, please, please send me a message on Facebook um, or send me an email. You've got my email address there. Um, or ask any questions in the Zoom chat as well. Um, I'll definitely be more than happy to answer those as they come in. Um, so basically what I'll cover today, um, we'll talk a little bit about how to study anatomy because it does vary a lot from person to person. Um, some really basic general anatomy stuff. Uh, and then we'll go into some, some of the nitty gritty upper limb um, anatomy, mainly focusing on innovation, arterial supply and venous drainage. Um, that's mainly because um, after speaking with some of the first years, those are the things that you guys have been struggling most with. Um, and then we'll talk at the end a bit about some clinical reasoning um, to get your minds thinking in the way that I guess you'll need to be thinking um, as you progress through the course. Cool. So what I won't cover, um, bones, muscles, lymphatics, something you'll learn during your dissections over the next year and a half is that lymphatics basically don't exist. Um, obviously they do and they're important, but not too important for upper limb, at least not at this stage. And bones and muscles, you guys can Google that or check in a textbook. Um, you don't need someone else, I don't think. That's not to say that if you, don't, if you need any help, you can't contact any of us. By all means, um, contact second years you know, speak to your friends, speak to your anatomy demonstrator, and by all means, again, send me a message. I'm more than willing to help. So how do we study anatomy? Well, I think the dot point sums it up. There's no one way that works for everyone. Um, for me, I like to read the textbook chapter and then apply it to the, the prac manual that we get and then work it in with the lecture notes and clin skills as well. I'm trying to integrate everything together. Um, but that doesn't work for everyone. Um, and I think that you've got to use this semester to figure out which way works for you. You've got a whole nother year coming up ahead of you. Um, and it, it really does vary from person to person. So suss out what your friends are doing, um, see if it works for them. If it works for them, it might work for you. So it's worth trying it out. Um, but otherwise, don't, get, don't beat yourself up if the way you're studying anatomy at the moment doesn't work exactly as you'd like to. All right, um, so we'll go into a bit of general anatomy quickly. Um, so starting with the anatomical position, um, this is really important because it, it's basically like a universal standard um, for figuring out, or at least for describing where things are in the body relative to other, um, other structures. Um, and so essentially the dot points there explain um, the anatomical position. With the person standing upright, facing forward, their arms are straight, held down, palms are facing forward, so their thumbs are outside or lateral, um, and the feet are parallel with the toes facing forward. Um, so this is important in regards to, let's say, I've raised my hand above my head. My hand is not superior to my head. Um, that's because all our, I guess, comparative terms are relative to the anatomical position. Therefore, no matter where my right hand is relative to my head in physical space, it's always going to be inferior. So now moving on to some general anatomical terms. Um, I know this slide is not formatted very nicely, but I think the, the all caps at the top is the most important takeaway that all these terms are relative terms um, and they have to be used in comparison to another word. So we've obviously got left and right, which you guys should know by now. Um, superior, inferior, which is the same as cranial and caudal. So cranial refers to the head, caudal refers to the tail or the feet, um, so more inferiorly. Medial, towards the midline, lateral, away from the midline. Um, anterior and posterior is the same as ventral or dorsal. So if you imagine a shark with its dorsal fin out of the water, um, that's towards the back of the shark. Therefore, ventral is gonna be the opposite and towards the belly. Um, and proximal and distal. So proximal and distal are generally only used um, in relation to the limbs um, as being closer or further to the trunk of the body. 
And then lastly about general anatomy, we'll talk a bit about body planes. Um, so the first one, which is probably the easiest one to remember is transverse plane. Um, so that's the one that cuts the body into a top and bottom half. Um, it's really, really important that you understand transverse planes. Um, they're used a lot in CT and MRI imaging. So as you go through more anatomy, um, you'll be using more CT and MRI. Um, and it's, yeah, important to know. It also is known as the axial plane. Um, for some reason on CT and MRI, they don't call it transverse sectioning. They call it um, axial sectioning. I'm not exactly sure why, but that's just the way it is. Um, next one is coronal. So the way I remember this one is that if you've got a crown in your hands, so corona means crown, and you put the crown on your head, um, your hands are basically, as they come down, would split your body into front and back halves. So that's the way I remember that one. And then sagittal is the other one, um, which basically splits the body into left and right halves. Um, it's important to note that these sections don't need to be mid-sagittal, mid-coronal. Um, so they can be where they split the body exactly into front and back halves or left and right halves. But they can also be um, off the midline, um, which can be useful in terms of other sorts of imaging techniques. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through how I like to study anatomy, specifically through the upper limb. Um, I find it really useful instead of having to memorize all these tiny little muscles and all these tiny little parts of bones and stuff and exactly where they go and what they do and what innervates them and their blood supply. Um, so the three dot points at the top basically explain um, what I mean by that in that it's important to learn roughly where the muscle sits and note the orientation of its muscle fibers. Um, by that I don't mean memorize its proximal and distal attachments, I mean have a look at where the muscle is, specifically in dissection, it can be really useful, um, and see roughly where it attaches. Then again, with the orientation of the muscle fibers is really important because by having these two um, bits of information, you can kind of put it together and infer what movements this muscle might perform, which can be really, really um, useful instead of memorizing movements as part of another massive table that you're creating. Um, second dot point is to learn the course of the nerves, um, which we'll go through today. And the third would be to learn the course of the arteries and to a lesser extent, the veins um, surrounding the muscles as well. Um, this is important because a nerve that travels near or through a muscle is likely to innervate that muscle and the same with the artery and its blood supply. So essentially what I'm saying is, if you know these general and generic um, kind of methods of, of learning all the information, you, instead of knowing, bam, off the top of your head, a tiny little piece of information that you've been storing up there for months, you can kind of infer and imply and work through it logically um, based on the information that you do know. Um, so like I said, you can basically hazard a guess and more often than not, it's actually quite accurate. So now we'll talk a bit about nerves. Um, so first, the goddamn brachial plexus. Um, so you guys are expected to know how to draw the brachial plexus, um, which is a bit sad, but I guess it's just a fact of life. Um, and faculty will tell you that these little branches here that come off, you don't need to know. And they're right in that you don't need to know where they come off and what, um, like, how to draw them on a brachial plexus drawing, but they're wrong in that you definitely need to know some of them. Um, you'll kind of figure out which ones you do and don't need to know based on your anatomy active learning sessions, the clinical cases ones, um, or the, the lab manual um, that you were given, because the things that come up in tut and specimens and imaging questions, and obviously in the active learning cases, they're the things that are going to be assessed again. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're doing your revision. Um, so we'll quickly run through the brachial plexus. Um, so imagine here where my mouse is now, you've got the vertebral column and you've got your spinal nerves coming out of the, so imagine there's a person's head here, we're essentially looking at their right upper limb, okay? So 
if you can imagine, C5 down to T1 is going from lateral to medial. That's because in our anatomical position, the upper spinal nerves are more, are gonna end up on the outside of the arm, which is more lateral than medial, okay? So we've got our roots. So I'll also quickly explain my little mnemonic down the bottom here. Um, the way I remember the five different, I guess, stages um, is rugby teams drink cold beer. Um, so the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. So if we start at the roots, the ones that make up the brachial plexus are C5 to T1, which you guys all should know. Um, then what happens is C5 and C6 merge to form this trunk, C7 continues to form this trunk, and C8 and T1 merge to form this one here. How do we name the trunks? Thankfully, it's pretty logical. We've got superior, middle, and inferior, um, which we like. Now we've got our three trunks, and at this point, they're going to each split into an anterior and posterior division. So if we look um, up, at this middle one here, we're gonna end up with only one posterior division total, while we have two anterior divisions as well. So our middle, uh, sorry, we'll start with our superior trunk. That's gonna give off a, an anterior branch over here and a posterior branch, oops, and a posterior branch over here. Our middle trunk is going to give an anterior branch up to the top and a posterior branch to the posterior division. Then our inferior trunk is going to give an anterior division over here and a posterior division over here. So now we're looking at our cords. Um, this is where at least I found it a bit tricky in first year um, was the naming of these cords. It really didn't make sense to me at first. Um, that we've got lateral, still got medial, but this is now posterior. Um, that made no sense to me and I really need to wrap my head around it. Um, and then I learned that the reason this is posterior and lateral and medial is because these terms are relative to the axillary artery. So imagine that this um, posterior cord is further into the computer screen and there's a tube or an artery sitting in this space here. Okay, that means that our lateral cord is going to be lateral to the artery, medial cord is going to be medial to the artery, and our posterior cord is going to be posterior to the axillary artery. That kind of makes sense now. Um, and then lastly, our cords are going to split into branches. So we've got our muscular cutaneous branch, and that's contributed by C5, 6, and 7 from the lateral cord. We, then the lateral cord also contributes to the median nerve, which we'll come back to. We've got our medial cord, which is going to give rise to the ulnar nerve, which is C8 and T1. It's also going to contribute C8 and T1 to the median nerve. So now the median nerve has contributions from all five spinal nerve roots. Then we're going to go back to our posterior cord, and it's going to split into two here. One, the axillary nerve, which for some reason only gets contribution from C5 and C6, and our radial nerve, which gets contribution from all five spinal nerve roots. Um, I think that's all for this slide. You really need to learn how to draw this. Um, as much as it's crap, you just need to. Um, and again, know some things about some of the um, often brought up nerves, so like your long thoracic nerve, your phrenic nerve, um, thoracodorsal, and something maybe like suprascapular. If you've got time, learn more. If you don't, just go with the big ones. So now we'll go into the specific um, branches and their courses through the body. So we'll start with the muscular cutaneous nerve. Um, and essentially it comes from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus, like I just mentioned, so C5, 6, and 7. It exits the axilla or the armpit by piercing through coracobrachialis. So you can see the coracoid process here where my cursor is, um, and it attaches into the arm. So that therefore, this muscle here is coracobrachialis. Um, it's going to descend between the two heads of 
biceps brachii, which you can't see, um, as well as the brachialis underneath. Um, and like I mentioned before, where a nerve passes near to a muscle group or through a muscle group, it's likely to um, supply that muscle group as well. So you can see that the, the nerves passing through. And then as it reaches the lateral area here, it becomes the cutaneous nerve of the forearm. So essentially it's going to supply motor function to the anterior compartment of the arm, as well as sensory um, function to the lateral aspect of the forearm. Um, yeah. Next we've got our axillary nerve. So that's from the posterior cord. So you can see here the cords. Um, and we are going to exit the axillary fossa posteriorly. So we've got our quadrangular space. Um, and it's going to run in association with the circumflex humeral artery, the posterior one. Um, this nerve is going to wind around the surgical neck of the humerus, deep to the deltoid, but it's also going to innervate the deltoid um, around the shoulder here. Um, this muscle supplies um, motor function to the glenohumeral joint, teres minor, and deltoid muscles, and all the muscles associated with that, and cutaneous innervation to the skin of the superolateral arm. Um, this will become important. Remember this slide for when we talk about clinical significance. Next, we've got the median nerve. Um, so that gets contributions from both the lateral and medial cords um, and gets kind of um, contributions from all the spinal nerve roots, so C5 to T1. Um, as you can see, if, you're gonna if you can follow my, um, my mouse here, we've got the lateral cord merging with the medial cord to form the median nerve. And at the top, the median nerve is lateral to the axillary artery. Um, so as we get further down the arm, it crosses over the artery and ends up medial to the artery. Okay, And then we get to the um, cubital fossa, which is the part of the elbow, anterior part of the elbow, sorry. And that's where, um, by that time, the median nerve, median nerve should be medial to the brachial artery. Um, then the nerve is going to um, pass between the heads of pronator teres, which you can see here, um, and it's going to descend between the two lay layers of um, wrist flexors, so the flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, and it's going to run deep to the palmaris longus tendon, which would sit over the top here, as it enters through the carpal tunnel, so under the flexor retinaculum. Um, this nerve doesn't innervate anything in the arm, it kind of bypasses the arm, innervates the majority of the um, forearm flexors, except for the ulna half or the medial half, which will be innervated by the ulna nerve. Um, and Essentially, go into the um, into the hand, and it's going to innervate majority of the muscles of the thumb or the thena eminence, um, as well as providing sensory information um, to the majority of the palmar skin. So it's a pretty important nerve, especially for fine motor skills. So they're things like holding a pen, writing your name the things that involve the really little muscles of the hand rather than big movements like throwing a ball. Um, next, we've got our radial nerve. So that's going to come from the posterior cord uh, and it's, um, it's going to get con contributions from all of the five major spinal levels, so C5 to T1. Um, and as it exits the axillary fossa, it's going to, come, it's going to remain posterior to the axillary artery because it's from the posterior cord. It's going to pass posterior to the humerus in the radial groove. Um, so this is important because it's going to run with the profunda brachii artery, um, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And it's going to go between the heads, some of the heads of the triceps. Um, so this is important again because it's likely to innervate that muscle. Um, it's going to enter the cubital fossa anterior to the lateral epicondyle. That's the, uh, the outside part of the elbow. Um, and it's going to run anterior to it, whereas the ulnar nerve would run um, 
posterior to the medial epicondyle. So it's a bit nice that they work kind of in conjunction or opposite. Um, and then it, the radial nerve is going to divide into motor and cutaneous um, radial nerves. So the motor nerve is going to basically innervate the wrist extensors. So that's the posterior compartment of the forearm. Whereas the cutaneous nerve is going to run all the way down along the, the um, radial aspect, down through to the anatomical snuff box, where it's going to provide sensory information to some of the dorsum of the hand, um, while the median nerve did the palmar aspect. And there are plenty of um, diagrams online which can show you the, I guess, the distribution of cutaneous or sensory information um, picked up by each nerve. And then lastly, we've got the ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve um, comes from the medial cord and it's gonna descend through the medial arm. It's not really gonna do much. It passes posterior to the medial epicondyle of the humerus. It's very superficial here. That's your funny bone um, sensation there. So if you knock that bit of your arm, it can be quite painful. It's then going to descend along the ulnar aspect of the forearm between the flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum profundus. Um, and it becomes superficial at the distal aspect of the forearm as it gets close to the hand. It's gonna not go through the carpal tunnel, so it's gonna go over the flexor retinaculum, but it goes within its own little sheath of the ulnar canal um, along with the ulnar artery. So it's kind of a bit different. And then it also um, innovates majority of the adductors and abductors of the fingers. So they're your palma and um, dorsal interosse, um, as well as the muscles of the hypothenar eminence or the muscles around the, um, the pinky. Um, it also provides cutaneous or sensory information from the most medial one and a half fingers of skin, worth of skin. Um, yeah. Next, we're gonna talk about arteries. So yeah, those were, I'm basically just going through the information related to nerves, arteries, and veins, and then we'll put it all into practice. Um, so next we'll talk a bit about the course of the arteries. Here's a bit of a schematic quickly. Um, so you can see here we've got our left ventricle from the heart, and blood's gonna enter the aortic arch where there are three different branches, the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian. Um, the reason it's different from the right to the left, don't know exactly, but the brachiocephalic trunk is going to split into the right common carotid and the right subclavian. Once we get to the subclavians on either side, it's basically the same track down to the hands. So we've got our, from our subclavian into our axillary, into the brachial, which then splits into the radial and ulnar, which then supplies the hand and fingers through the digital arteries. Um, yep. And so again, we've just got some more diagrams here, which kind of just show it um, as a diagram rather than a schematic. Um, feel free again to Google and you will find plenty of these. So let's start with the subclavian artery. So the right subclavian starts um, as the brachiocephalic artery, or brachiocephalic trunk, sorry. And the left um, starts, as the, starts from the aortic arch. Now it's basically, it's a pretty short artery. Um, and it basically ends around here once it gets to the lateral border of rib one. So we can see the rib one here where my mouse is. And at the lateral border, um, we change to the, we're gonna to change to axillary artery. And the same thing on the left-hand side. Then we've got our axillary artery. So again, it's gonna start from the lateral border of rib one, which is up here. And then we're going, to go until the inferior border of teres major. So you can see teres major here, not part of the rotator cuff, um, but close association. And at that point, we become the brachial artery. Now, this artery is really important for the brachial plexus, remember, where around this point, we've got the lateral, medial, and behind it, the posterior cords of the brachial plexus. Um, so again, a really important um, association to remember as we're going through it. Um, the axillary artery is split into three parts. So we've got the first part, which starts from the lateral part 
of the first rib and goes to the superior border of pectoralis minor. Um, and that has one branch, the superior thoracic artery. Then we've got the second part, which is where from the, basically the parts of the artery that are posterior to pec minor, and that has two branches. So the second part has two branches, the thoracochromial artery and the lateral thoracic artery. Um, and then the third part goes from the inferior border of pectoralis minor to the inferior border of teres major or the end of the axillary artery. And it has three major branches. So they are the subscapular, anterior humeral circumflex and posterior humeral circumflex arteries. Um, and yeah, there's a little acronym down the bottom there um, if you want. But again, this isn't such high yield information. Um, it's just kind of to orientate you guys and make it a little bit easier for learning things like the muscles, their blood supply and their innervation. Next, we've got the brachial artery. So that starts from the inferior border of teres major where the axillary artery ended and it goes down all the way to where it bifurcates into the radial and ulna arteries. Usually that happens in the cubital fossa, um, so the anterior part of the arm, uh, of the elbow, sorry. Um, but it's important to note that it has, it can have a lot of anatomical variation. Um, sometimes the bifurcation can happen halfway up the arm um, or even higher, um, more superior. So yeah, just be aware of that when looking in, at your donors, um, and looking in textbooks as well. But essentially the artery runs along the, um, what we've got here, the ventromedial surface or the anteromedial surface of the arm um, until it gets to the cubital fossa. And it's running in close proximity to the median nerve, as we discussed earlier. Um, you guys in first SEM would have learned how to take vital signs. And when you did blood pressure, you put the, the stethoscope um, over the brachial artery, which is quite medial to relative to the arm. Um, so that's another little handy trick to remembering where the brachial artery goes. Um, and the main branch of the brachial artery um, is the profunda brachii artery, which we're gonna talk about now. So the profunda brachii artery, it comes from the lateral and posterior aspects of the brachial artery. So up here, where my cursor is, um, and it's going to end around the lateral epicondyle, where it's going to anastomose with the radial recurrent artery. Um, so for those that don't know, anastomosis is basically where two arteries, um, or multiple, um, don't exactly meet, but they exchange blood supply. Um, so it's just a nice little way of, kind of if one of the arteries screws up, there's still going to be blood supply to that region. So it's really important, um, and you'll see it a lot um, around the organs um, in the abdomen and other things later on. Um, and so this artery is going to basically follow the radial nerve along the radial groove on the posterior aspect of the humerus, um, and it's going to supply blood to the muscles of the posterior arm, whereas the brachial artery was going to supply to the anterior. Um, compartment of the arm. Next we've got the radial artery. Uh, so this is the main artery of the lateral aspect of the forearm. So it's going to start at the bifurcation of the brachial artery and the cubital fossa and it's going to run distally along the anterior forearm and it's going to serve as a landmark for us because it splits, it separates the anterior and posterior forearm compartment. So as you can see here, the anterior forearm compartment would be here and the posterior would be around here. Uh, it's gonna wind laterally around the wrist. It's gonna pass through the anatomical snuff box and between the heads of the adductor pollicis, okay? Forming the deep palmar arch, which you can see here where my cursor is on this diagram of the hand. Um, it's important to know that the radial and ulnar arteries, um, they, both form both parts of the arches, but the radial artery is generally in textbooks denoted as the main provider of the deep palmar arch, as the ulnar artery provides the superficial palmar arch. And the ulnar artery is going to be the main supply of the medial forearm. Um, again, it starts at the bifurcation of the brachial artery and the cubital fossa, and it basically comes down um, medially 
and it's going to go through the ulna canal, so that's on top of the um, flexor inoculum, um, along with the ulna nerve, and it's going to provide the superficial palmar arch um, of the hand. Now, if we go back just to have a look at this image, we've got the superficial palmar arch here, um, and both the superficial and deep palmar arches are going to provide blood to the, um, the digits or the fingers um, so that they can grow and live as they should. Now we'll talk quickly about veins. Um, so we start with the deep veins. So in general, um, we've got deep veins all throughout our body and they generally have the accompanying name or they have a, they're named according to the accompanying artery. So in terms of deep veins of the arm, or sorry, of the upper limb, um, we have radial and ulnar veins which accompany the radial and ulnar arteries. Um, together, they drain, they drain together to form the brachial vein, which would again be associated with the brachial artery. Um, so that makes it pretty easy in terms of deep, deep veins. Um, and then when we look at superficial veins, we've got two veins in the forearm. So we've got the basilic vein, which is essentially the equivalent of the ulna vein, but superficial, and the cephalic vein, which is the equivalent of the radial vein, but more superficial. Um, both of these veins also con continue up into the arm, as you can see here. But what's interesting is that the cephalic vein um, gives off a branch to the basilic vein, and that branch, which is denoted here by this arrow, um, is the median cubital vein. Um, it's really important clinically for venipuncture and cannulation. Um, it's a really, I guess it's just a major site um, where those procedures are often done, um, mainly due to the superficiality of the vein. So we then have our basilic and cephalic veins in the arm. Um, and as you can see here, the brachial vein, remember that was a, one of the deep veins, drains into the basilic vein, which forms the axillary vein at the top. And then further superior, which we can't see in this diagram, the cephalic vein drains into the axillary vein to form the subclavian vein, um, which would be sub or below the clavicle or subclavian. Um, and then this will eventually drain into the superior vena cava of the heart and then begin its pathway around the body again. So we'll quickly talk about some um, nice little regions of the body. So we'll start with the cubital fossa. Um, so the cubital fossa is basically the anterior aspect of the elbow. Um, you can see here its borders. So we've got a superior border, which is the imaginary line between the lateral and medial epicondyles of the humerus. The medial border is made up of the lateral aspect of the pronator teres. And the lateral border is made up of the medial aspect of brachioradialis. So essentially that forms a little triangle. And within that triangle, the main, um, the main um, structures that we see um, can be denoted by the acronym TAM um, if you're looking from midline to medial. So you can feel it on yourself. You've got the biceps tendon in the midline. And then a bit medially to that, you've got your brachial artery. So again, that's where you put your stethoscope when taking um, blood pressure. And then you've got the median nerve just medial to that. Um, so remember how the median nerve crossed over to the medial side of the artery as it descends through the arm. This is where it should end up. And then we've got the carpal tunnel. Um, so if you imagine, so this side here is our thumb side or our female side, or our lateral side. This is our medial side, or our hypothenal side or our pinky side. Um, this is anterior posterior and if we're looking um, through we're basically looking behind the screen would be distal and in front of the screen would be proximal um, so as you can see here we've got our ulna artery and nerve and they would be um, basically in, encompassed by a sheath um, and we've got our, our flexor retinaculum which would come over here or the transverse carpal ligament and then you've got our carpal tunnel here. So see how it fits in nicely among the carpal bones. Um, that's just 
showing you a little bit. So we've got, in terms of the carpal tunnel, there are 10 things to remember, um, but thankfully they're pretty all right. So we've got our four tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis and four tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus, so superficial and deep layers, and they're just gonna to attach to the fingers to help with flexion. We've got our flexor pollicis longus tendon, which is going to flex the thumb. Um, and we've also got our median nerve. Again, this has a lot of clinical significance and we'll probably talk about it. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about to, con that, to cover in terms of content. Um, but now we've got some clinical scenarios. Um, I don't really have the capability to ask you guys what you guys think, but we'll go through the scenarios step by step and we'll work through it together. So, here's a scenario for you. Jenna, a 19-year-old female, was playing a game of footy when an opponent ran into her shoulder head-on. She was presented to ED with pain in her left shoulder. On history, and yeah, these history and exam findings are completely made up. There would be a lot of other things that you would see, um, and you may or may not see some of the signs that I've got written down. So, um, take what I've written with a grain of salt, but use it for a learning exercise, I guess. Um, we've got 9 out of 10 pain in the left shoulder, obvious deformity and tenderness over the area, and an inability to use the affected arm. So given the history, knowing that it, we're looking at a trauma case, um, and we've got obvious deformity, pain and tenderness, and an inability to use the affected arm, we should be thinking along the lines of a fracture or a dislocation, um, just because they seem like the most likely thing to be occurring right now. Um, and then in terms of what investigation would you like to order? Well, there's no point ordering bloods. Um, that won't really tell us anything useful. Uh, so instead, we're going to look for imaging techniques. Now, I know you guys have probably learned this already, but we've got our, our three main forms of imaging that we can use. Um, and those are X-ray, CT, and MRI. Um, we won't use an MRI for this situation, although it will give us all the information and more that we would ever need. Uh, it takes a really long time and it's very, very expensive. Um, and we probably won't do a CT either because as much as it gives us a bit more information um, and it still does take a little bit longer than an X-ray, it's more expensive. And most importantly, there's a really large dose of radiation that you wouldn't want to be giving to a 19 year old female unnecessarily. Um, so we'll choose to have a look at an X-ray and you can see here that we've got um, a copy of this x-ray. So in terms of what we can see on this x-ray, we've got an um, AP view or frontal view, anterior posterior view of the shoulder, um, the left shoulder. Um, normally you would have like a little L or an R, so it would make it easier, but it is. Um, we can have a look at the humerus and it looks to be in the glenoid fossa very nicely. There doesn't seem to be any fractures along the bone that we can see here. Uh, we can have a look at all the ribs, and I don't see any evidence of fractures along the ribs either. Um, the vertebrae seem to be nice, and sorry, another reason we can tell that this is the left side is because you can see the shadow of the heart here in the thorax. Um, scapulas are very hard to fracture, so not too concerned there, but you can see the outline of the scapula here. And then we look at the clavicle, and we can see a clear fracture there. Um, so clavicle fractures most commonly occur um, because of a fall on the outstretched arm or by a direct blow to the shoulder or the clavicle itself, um, which matches our, the history that we've had, that we've gotten, sorry. Um, they most likely, most often occur in the middle third of the clavicle itself, um, specifically at the interchange between the middle third and the lateral third. Um, that's the, the most common point of fracture. I don't know why that's the case. It's probably just a bit weaker there. Um, now, something interesting to note is why does the medial um, portion of the clavicle tend to go superiorly while the lateral portion goes inferiorly? Um, you got to think of the attachments of what this bone, the clavicle, is attached to now. So the clavicle attaches to the sternum over here, the sternoclavicular joint, which is very well anchored based on the ribs, the thoracic cage, and the vertebrae posteriorly. So it's going to hold it really nice and tight. 
Whereas over here, although it's tightly bound to the acromion of the scapula at the um, acromioclavicular joint, you've got the weight of a whole upper limb pulling down on this little portion of clavicle. So no wonder the, the, the aspect of the, lat, sorry, the lateral fracture um, is going to end up a little bit more inferiorly. Um, this x-ray doesn't show it normally, but sometimes you can get um, the bone fragments actually piercing through the skin, depending on how far um, superior or inferior they are. So our likely diagnosis is a clavicle fracture um, with shaft. Um, then in terms of the at-risk structures, we've got the early parts of the brachial plexus, remember, because we've got our um, subclavian artery, so we're not at the axillary artery yet, meaning we can't be at the cords yet, but we can be earlier and more um, proximal in terms of the brachial plexus, as well as the subclavian artery behind it. Um, so it isn't too uncommon to get a sharp bony fragment from a clavicle fracture to sever the subclavian artery or vein, which can be quite nasty in terms of um, the damage it can have. And in terms of a basic management plan, well, say that Jen is in nine out of 10 pain. So first of all, we should be giving pain relief. Um, and depending on the fracture itself, it may require surgery, um, specifically if the bones are not aligned nicely. Um, and also immobilization. So just making sure that Jen is not using the arm once it's fractured. Um, you guys don't need to know management plans yet. Um, we don't need to know in the second years yet either. But I think having a general idea of roughly how you would treat something, so not specifically which pain meds you would give, how long you would need to immobilize for, how long to wear a sling or whatever, but knowing the general principles will make it a lot easier as you do need to start learning them. So just kind of maybe familiarize yourself with it. Next case. Cool. A 39 year old male professional weightlifter goes to his GP presenting with unilateral pain in his right posterior forearm. So on history and exam, um, pain is localized to the right posterior forearm. It's an aching pain that's been slowly getting worse over the past two weeks. Weightlifting makes it more painful. Rest and pain relief make it better. Um, tenderness over the, is found over the lateral elbow. And there is a lot of pain when resisting wrist extension. So we should be thinking, okay, this, is, this isn't a trauma case. This is more likely a case of overuse of the structure that we're talking about because it's been slowly getting worse over the past two weeks and it's an aching pain, not so much a shooting pain or a stabbing pain, um, which would imply something more neurological. So because we've got a more dull aching pain, um, we should be thinking that it's a bit more muscular in nature. Um, and considering he is a professional weightlifter and does this for a living, you can imagine that there is a lot of overuse of um, the muscles that we're talking about. So if we're looking, there's pain that's localized to the right posterior forearm, those are your forearm extensors. And if there's pain when resisting that movement, we can infer that those muscles are being um, incorporated into the movement itself. And then there's tenderness over the lateral elbow. What bony structure sits over the lateral elbow? The lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So this is actually, a, so what is the likely diagnosis? Well, it's likely to be lateral epicondylitis, also known as tennis elbow, um, for the reasons that I explained before. And in terms of management of this condition, well, if it's an overuse condition, um, generally we need to rest it. So stop using those muscles, um, provide pain relief, might need to do a bit of physiotherapy, stretching, and often the use of a splint to help immobilize and rest those muscles um, is recommended. Next case, we've got a 58 year old woman who has had her axillary lymph nodes removed during surgery. Upon discharge, the doctor notices a structural change when she goes to push the door open. What is this phenomenon called? explain the reasons for this occurring, 
and how could it be relevant in this patient given, given the history that we just read? So this phenomenon is known as a winged scapula. Um, and essentially the reason it happens is that there's the muscles known as serratus anterior and their main role is to um, draw the scap, so they sit between the scapula and the thoracic cage and their job is to draw the scapula anteriorly against the ribs. Um, now, that basically tells us that there's something wrong with the serratus anterior. Well, not necessarily. There could be something wrong with the muscle itself, or there could be something wrong with the nerve that innervates that muscle. In this case, the nerve that innervates the um, serratus anterior is the long thoracic nerve. It's one of those branches off the brachial plexus that I mentioned earlier. Um, and how, so how could it be relevant in this patient? So we're thinking, okay, there's either something wrong with the long thoracic nerve or something wrong with the serratus anterior muscle itself. Um, if we go back to the scenario, uh, this woman's had her axillary lymph nodes removed during surgery. Now, if you Google an image of the, long, the course of the long thoracic nerve, it actually passes um, along the medial, sorry, the, the external surface of the ribs of the thoracic cage, but along the medial border of the axilla or close to it. So it's quite, well, not quite likely, but in this situation, there's a chance that the surgeon may have nicked the long thoracic nerve while performing the surgery, um, which would have rendered the serratus anterior non-functional, um, which would have resulted in the wind scapula. So this was a case more of, we need to be aware of the cause and effect of each of the steps that we're doing. Um, once you understand that and you can work through it in a process like that, it makes it a lot easier to go through. Um, next one. A 17-year-old male is on a hike near a waterfall when he slips on a rock and attempts to break his fall with his hands. He immediately feels extreme pain in his right hand that doesn't go away with pain relief. He then presents to the ED. So on history and exam, the patient complains of pain along the base of the thumb and in the anatomical snuff box, which is not getting better with NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Not sure if you guys have covered that yet, but that's your things like ibuprofen um, or neurofen. There's no obvious deformity, but there's a lot of pain on movement of the fingers. So what investigation will we like to order? Well, again, we're not gonna do bloods, not gonna do an MRI, not gonna do CT. So we'll go for an X-ray first. Um, when looking at this X-ray, what do we see here? I've spoken to a couple of my second year friends and they had absolutely no clue. Um, so this will be helpful as well for, for us. But um, what looks like two separate bones here should actually be one. Um, this is the scaphoid here um, with a nice clean fracture in the middle. Um, otherwise, this is all quite normal. So this would be our thumb side here, our pinky side here. This is our radius and this is our ulna. Um, so the likely diagnosis is a scaphoid fracture, um, which often occurs from a fall on the outstretched hand. That's the general mechanism of injury. Um, a common and serious complication that arises from this um, is very serious um, and it's quite common. Studies estimate between 15 and 30% of scaphoid fractures end up with avascular necrosis of the scaphoid. Um, so that's essentially where part of the bone doesn't get blood supply and therefore the cells begin to necrose or die. Um, which can be really bad because necrosis is not good for anything and then it can spread to other parts of the hand and could end up needing amputation if it um, goes real bad. So how does this complication arise in scaphoid fractures? Well, we've got our radial artery, right, which runs around here through the anatomical snuff box and then provides a branch to the distal part of the scaphoid and then uses retrograde blood flow. So in terms of arteries, we expect blood to go from proximal to distal. When we talk retrograde, we're talking where blood comes from distal to proximal. So in this case, we've got our blood supply coming retro in a retrograde direction. And if we've got a fracture here, it's more likely that the blood vessel won't be able to reach this fragment of bone. Now this happens more often when the actual 
um, bone fractures more proximally. So the more proximal the fracture, the more likely necrosis is going to happen because there's a greater distance between the start of the artery up at the distal end to where the actual bony fragment that needs the blood is. Um, yeah, that's a, a nice little tricky one. Um, our next case is a 32-year-old construction worker who has gotten stabbed with a knife in their inferior axilla, now presenting to ED. So on history and exam, uh, you, when you get to see them, the x-ray taken by the clinician comes back normal, bleeding in the axilla has been managed, and the patient is tested for neurovascular compromise at the fingers, which returns normal. Um, so something one of my anatomy demonstrators last year taught me was when testing for motor function um, at the three nerves of the fingers, so your radial, median, and ulnar nerves, um, what you can do is you can stick your hand out like you're stopping a car, making a stop sign, um, and that's basically testing your forearm extensors. You can then spread your hand into a star, um, which is testing the interosseous muscles of the hand, and then you can make an okay sign, which tests the median nerve. So essentially you stop a car, make a star, and say okay. And that tests the function of the radial nerve, ulnar nerve, and median nerve respectively. Um, there are obviously other ways to test that as well by looking at sensation and things like that. Um, cool. So then the patient complains of some numbness or tingling in their shoulder. There also seems to be a visible flattening of the lateral contour of the shoulder. Um, what might be causing this? Justify your answer. And what distribution do you expect the numbness or tingling to take over the shoulder? So we're thinking, we know that the median nerve, um, ulnar nerve, and radial nerve are all intact because they've got motor control down at the fingers. So that should be fine because now we're talking about the shoulder. So that leaves the muscular cutaneous and the axillary nerves that could be responsible. And the reason we're thinking neurological is because of the numbness and tingling that we see here. Um, so when we think about visible flattening of the lateral contour of the shoulder, what muscle would be responsible for that? Likely to be the deltoid. And what nerve innervates the deltoid? The axillary nerve. So knowing these little bits of information can really, like what I was explaining at the start of the lecture, can really explain um, the clinical presentation and clinical manifestation of when things go wrong. Um, so we're thinking that it's an axillary nerve palsy or just loss of function of the axillary nerve. Um, and what distribution do we expect the numbness or tingling to take over the shoulder? This is very buzzwordy, um, but the regimental badge area, um, which sits over the lateral aspect of the deltoid, um, as you can kind of see here, where C5 and C6 would be. Um, faculty will say that they don't like buzzwords. They love buzzwords. Um, so get used to it, but in terms of a clinical um, setting, buzzwords don't normally work as you like them to. Um, next, a 78-year-old man trips over at home and sticks his arms out to try and break his fall. He immediately feels intense pain in his shoulder area and gets driven to the ED to figure out what's going on. So again, we should be thinking straight away that it's more of a trauma-based case, um, and we should be thinking uh, fracture or dislocation. Um, because it's happened so suddenly and on history and examination, there was no loss of consciousness. We can see swelling and deformity around the affected area with tenderness and an inability to use the affected arm. What investigation would you like to order? You'll better say x-ray um, and this is what you get. So again, we can see a, an x-ray of the left shoulder. Um, quite obviously here, we've got a fracture that's a bit displaced, but we don't have dislocation of the humeral head in the glenoid fossa. Um, so what part of the humerus is this where the fracture has happened? And it's actually the part where most fractures happen and happen most commonly here, which is the surgical neck of the humerus. Um, so we're thinking it's a surgical neck of humerus fracture. Um, what's a common mechanism of this injury? Well, as this gentleman has shown us, a fall on the outstretched hand can do it, but also a direct blow to the shoulder um, can fracture the humerus here. And in terms of what structures are vulnerable, as I mentioned earlier when talking about the nerves, the axillary nerve runs posterior to the surgical neck, um, as does the posterior circumflex humeral artery. Um, so there can be issues with um, nicking the nerve or severing the artery 
um, that would not be very nice. And that's exactly why we need to do these kinds of x-rays before treating the patient. Um, yeah. Next one, a 53 year old cleaner presents to their GP with right shoulder pain. So the pain gets worse on consistent overhead movements. There's a bit of a buzzword for you. So reaching overhead, dusting things up high. Um, on a range of motion during shoulder abduction test, initially there is no pain, followed by a segment of pain, and then the pain subsides as the arm reaches vertical. Um, so you should be thinking about clinical skills right now and your shoulder examination, MSK exam, um, what special test is being done there. Um, rest and pain relief or NSAIDs helps, but the patient can't afford to stop working. Um, so that's something that we need to be aware of. And then there's swelling and tenderness on palpation of the shoulder. So again, we're thinking like with the, um, the tennis elbow before, this is likely an overuse um, injury. And in terms of buzzwords, um, we've got the overhead movements, which is very buzzwordy, as well as me describing the painful arc test, um, which returned positive. So those are both indications of rotator cuff tendinopathy. So that's essentially where um, one or more of the structures in the subacromial space um, is inflamed, which causes the other structures in that subacromial space to be inflamed. A lot of those structures are tendons of the rotator cuff muscles. Um, so like I said here, the anat anatomical um, likely place of the pain to be originated is the subacromial space and um, because there are lots of soft tissues in a small space and realistically once one of them becomes inflamed they're all going to become inflamed from rubbing against each other too much um, how would you manage this patient so again this is an overuse injury of the soft tissue or muscle mainly um, and our management plan should basically be pain relief like the patient's already been doing rest ice um, physiotherapy, some stretching, and if required, um, surgery. Um, but in this case, we really do need, would need to take into account the patient's livelihood and that they require to do these movements for work. So it might be a matter of getting an occupational therapist or to discuss how to alleviate the use of those specific muscles while doing work. So maybe incorporation of a step ladder and things like that. Next one. A mother and her three-year-old daughter come to the ED after the daughter complains of elbow pain following her mother pulling her daughter by the hand off the playground at the park. So on history of exam, there's no history of a fall. Forearm is pronated and held close to the body. Pain is only on elbow movement. There's no swelling or bruising or deformity. What investigation might you like to order? X-ray. So what do we see here? So we see a humerus at the elbow. We've got two bones. How do we know which is the radius, which is the ulna? Well, we know that the ulna has the olecranon, on, which articulates nicely with the humerus more superiorly. Therefore, this little bit here must be the radius. Now, you can actually see a small little bit of fracture there, um, but that's not what we're talking about, really. The fact that the head of the radius is so far inferior um, implies that what we've got here is a pulled el elbow or a radial head subluxation. So it's not a complete dislocation. Um, and generally the mechanism of injury is getting pulled. Um, but what's happened is that where the radius and the ulna normally articulate, there's a ligament that passes around where my cursor is called the annular ligament. And essentially by the pulling of the elbow or pulling of the hand, um, the radial head has slipped out of that ligament um, and is now hanging a little bit inferior. So how would you treat this um, condition? Well, you would basically, um, obviously you would go seek a medical attention, <laughs> um, but online you can find that um, if you flex the elbow and then alternate pronating and supinating the forearm, it should just click back into place gently. Um, and then obviously rest and monitoring to make sure that everything's okay. Um, I think we've got two more scenarios. So we've got a 28 year old female who's recently come into her GP. Pain, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. Pain in the left wrist. 
on history and examination. She is three months postpartum, so she's given birth three months ago. She had gained 12 kilos over the course of her pregnancy, otherwise it was uncomplicated. Um, pain extends from her left wrist to the tips of her fingers, and pain is worse first thing in the morning. So sometimes it wakes her up at night. Um, as soon as you hear pain in the wrist, um, you're thinking scaphoid fracture or carpal tunnel. Um, it's just a thing. I can't really think of much else um, that would be kind of clinically used by faculty. Um, and carpal tunnel is carpal tunnel syndrome is basically just where you've got entrapment or compression of the median nerve under the flexor retinaculum at the wrist. Um, it can be primary or secondary. So if it's primary, that means it's a neurological issue that arises from the median nerve itself. And if it's secondary, it's more likely a musculoskeletal issue that results in inflammation under the carpal under the flexor retinaculum of one of the um, the tendons, which would then um, kind of compress the carpal, the median nerve in the carpal tunnel, so impingement. Um, how would you manage this condition? Pain relief, again, immobilization or just not using the wrist. Um, often that involves wearing a splint to help take the, the pressure off. Um, so resting, icing, stretching it, and in very serious cases, um, we can have a flexor retinaculum release, which is a surgical procedure. And then we've got a 19 year old student is at the gym lifting a heavy barbell overhead when the bar begins to fall behind them. They are not able to let go of the bar in time and instantly feel a lot of pain in their right shoulder. So in history and exam, they've never had anything like this before. It's 10 out of 10 right shoulder pain. There's visible deformity of the shoulder and an inability to use the right arm. And there's tenderness and swelling present as well. Um, you all know what the investigation is gonna be. It's gonna be an X-ray. And we can see here quite clearly that the head of the humerus is not in the glenoid fossa where it should be. And so we've got a humeral dislocation, given the mechanism of injury. So if the, the rest of the arm has gone posteriorly with the bar, it's likely that the head of the humerus has popped out anteriorly. So we can um, say that we've got an anterior humeral dislocation at the glenoid fossa. Um, what structures are at risk? Well, we've got the axillary nerve, which passes posterior to the surgical neck of the humerus. So if we've got a dislocation here, it can disrupt that nerve pathway. And how would you manage, manage this patient? Well, obviously we need to reduce the shoulder. Um, that's just another word of relocate the shoulder. Um, and as soon as you do a reduction, you would want to do a follow-up X-ray to make sure that it's in the right spot again. Um, also, the pa patient has been in 10 out of 10 pain. So we're gonna give a lot of pain relief um, we're going to rest it, immobilize it, and we're going to monitor them to make sure all is good. Um, so that's all I've got. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat function on Zoom and ask away. Um, it should be down the bottom of the Zoom function. You can click chat and ask your questions. Um, otherwise, please, please, please send through any questions or confusions you have about upper limb anatomy. Um, I'm more than happy to help. I know that this lecture wasn't really so much about helping with exam prep. Um, I think that that's not really the point of these in-semester um, revision lectures. You will have another upper limb anatomy revision lecture in SWATMAC, and I think that will be focused more on answering exam questions. Um, whereas this is trying to get you guys into the right headspace of um, thinking about upper limb anatomy and how it relates to clinical practice. Um, I have also can help out with more scenarios if you guys need. Um, so yeah, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned stuff and please send me a message um, if you need any help with anything whatsoever. Alrighty, thank you.